Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. As we hit the middle of June, it's time to check with our gardening experts. Whether you prefer growing flowers or vegetables or both, our experts are back with tips to help resolve any problems that might be cropping up. It's always a pleasure to welcome Leonard Perry and Ann Hazelrig from the University of Vermont. Thanks so much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Now, Leonard, you're going to get things started, but with some flowers that you brought along. I always like to bring pretty flowers, mm -hmm. Judy, and uh, start with this lilac. And yes, there are lilacs still in bloom. There are actually early lilacs and late lilacs. Okay. And with a traditional type flowers. The late ones with the bigger flowers are the Preston types. This one is an, a Meyer lilac named after Explorer, um, but it has the smaller leaves and smaller flowers. Very fragrant though. Lilacs are great for pollinators. This one in particular, when I picked it, there were bees all over it. <laughs> I found a hummingbird moth and a yellow swallowtail butterfly all on this wow. bush when I picked it. So yeah, it was loaded with them. Terrific. And then I brought a potted plant, which I thought I would show. This is the time before a lot of things come into bloom with the perennials, but this one is great. It's coming into bloom, get three weeks. This is a perennial sage a salvia, but a perennial type. Very hardy, uh, low maintenance, very few pests. This one has an interesting name. It's called Wisui. That's <laughs> the cultivar. We, S-U, we, you know, so mm -hmm. Wisui. Um, and that, this I got from Full Circle Gardens in Essex. Um, other people may have it. Another one that's very popular and similar is called May Night. Um, and again, because it, it blooms early in the season, but just a great plant. The perennial salvia, is, and if you cut it back after bloom, some of these side shoots may come, you may get a second bloom. So nice. keep perennial salvias or sages in mind. Nice. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Anne, let's talk a little bit about uh, what some of the things that you're seeing in the lab or are being called into the Master Gardener Helpline. Yeah, well, you know, it's been a wet, cool mm -hmm. spring, and so that brings a whole bunch of different problems. And one of them we've gotten phone calls on, and I've seen in my own garden, are slugs and snails. Oh, yeah. And I'm actually surprised they're not worse this year, but I think that's probably because it was so dry at the end of the season last year. Yeah. But they really can uh, do a lot of damage on your plants. So if you go out to your garden in the morning and, and all of a sudden your plants have been chewed on, but you haven't seen a pest, it could be a slug or a snail. And they really have food preferences. This is a hosta, and they mm -hmm. cause these uh, rasped holes basically and so a lot of times you won't see them during the day so go out at night with a flashlight and see if they're there you can also look for the slime trails that's a good clue that a slug or snail has been there um, and they're pretty there are some good organic controls you can use copper banding mm -hmm. uh, around your plants or around your bed slugs don't like that also there's a, a good organic product called sluggo or Escargo. <laughs> so that's uh, if you've got a real problem, you could use something like that. Okay. There's so many cultural controls too. I know just putting a board in the garden, they'll, they'll go yeah, into right. that. Yeah, that's a good Roll one. newspaper, eggshells, right. coffee grounds. I've heard a lot yeah. of different things. I even heard of a study that tested different beers. Yeah, oh, that's <laughs> right. They go in and drown in the yeah. saucer of beer. <laughs> All right. What else have we got? Another no, no, slide. Um, well, another thing. Uh, this is also a problem that I'm seeing in my garden. I've had to plant my pumpkins <gasps> probably three times. Really? This is, this is just an example, but it's a. There are lots of root rots mm. just because when soils sit there wet and saturated, there are lots of different fungi that live in those soils that will attack seedlings either once they're up or while they're still underground and they just rot them. So there's really not any way to control it. Um, we can't control mother nature, but right. you just have to be ready to reseed some of those crops that are more susceptible to that kind of damage. Okay, and what else have we got here? Uh, so I think Leonard yeah, has Yeah, actually, a, you know, that makes me relieved. I haven't got my garden in yet. Plus, I've yeah, heard people have had some hail storms and right. yeah, they're having to replant to me. It's yeah. been tough, so I'm, I'm glad I'm late, you know? Yeah. Plus, when it warms up, things will catch up. Right, so even but, the experts, though, have some problems. Yeah, and one of the things that's been a banner year for, too, and I've noticed on this shrub dogwood, I brought a picture of this red twig dogwood with aphids. Now, the leaves were curling. I said, I better look, as you see on the right, I better look at that. And if you notice along the stem there, those are just 
chock full of hundreds of aphids. And it makes a plant, you know, especially some stems distorted. I just prune yeah. out this whole stems that are affected, you know, where it's affects, just starting to come in on some of the tips. Mm -hmm. um, I can, you know, just spray it with an organic type aphid spray that just knock them down. But um, aphids, and one of the things to look for, I noticed, was ants. Because the aphids secrete the honeydew, the ants feed on that. Oh, and so okay. if you see ants crawling around, that's why. And ants, and another question I get is ants on peonies. Peonies starting to open. Right. Um, they're not doing any harm. You don't have to worry about it. Some people say, well, the tight buds, the ants help open that. Well, you know, I'm not sure that's the case. They'll open anyway without the ants. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're not really doing any harm. Some of those, they're just after that nectar and some of the buds. Right, so you just knock them off if you're going to yeah. pick, picking your if peonies. If you're picking them to bring them in, just, you know, knock them off or just kind of dip the bud in some water so they'll <laughs> float off before you have them on your table. <laughs> now I've noticed that there was a pest in my garden too. I only have like three little hosta plants so far that I've planted and I noticed that something had eaten the, uh, the butt off of one and then that some damage to some of the leaves on another one. Then I discovered the culprit right there. <laughs> so did you see the uh, pest? Chewing away on the hosta plants. So you saw the uh, yes. pest in action. Yes, so. I did. Caught her red-handed. <laughs> wow. So yeah, I guess, you know, with pets in the garden, this is a problem. They're usually like digging around, uh, putting some wire mesh there to make it so they really don't want to dig. Yep. There are some sprays you can get to that just makes it unappealing. I know our cats hate the smell of mint. Mm -hmm. So you can get one of the, even make oh, up your own idea. and just spray some mint on there. It's not obnoxious to you, but the pests are really thing. <laughs> pests think, no, I'm not going there. All right, well, in our last uh, tip show last month, we talked about ticks. They're on the increase. Um, something, people should take precautions. If you're going to yeah, be out we, in the garden, be careful. You seem to hear stories all the time about the ticks. We all, you know, we've trained our own stories about them. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple new products. I always love to try these things. This is an armband. We talked before about the insecticide permethrin, which is really long lasting. These, This is, um, you know, has it built into it. Mm -hmm. And so it comes ready-made. So if the tick, if you're out working in the grass, it's, it's called insect guard. Mm -hmm. It comes up your arm. It's going to, you know, get in contact with that permethrin that's actually, you know, in here. And for your feet, this is something I really like. I, I brought the gators before, like you right. use for snow, and right. you spray them with their spray. Well, this is made, um, and I got these. It's called Limeys, and it's a mesh, uh, so it's cool. And you see it's just the Velcro. So you wrap it around your ankle, where your pants are, mm -hmm. so it encloses that. It's comfortable. You don't even know you have it on yet. It's tight. The tick tries to crawl up. It gets caught in a mesh exposed to the permethrin that's in, embedded in this as well and um, so that should get it. So a couple things people might want, I'm, I'm using this every time I go out and yeah. start gardening now, you just pop them on, it's very easy and uh, hopefully get some protection from that. Excellent. And you also have another precautionary device and it's aimed at keeping deer away. We brought this last year and I wanted to show this predator guard. It has two red lights mm -hmm. that at night, you know, solar powered, they come on, they flash, it's supposed to mimic a uh, predator for whatever you're trying to scare away. You put it at eye level. So I put it about a foot high mm -hmm. for the raccoons. Well, the raccoons thought, oh, isn't that fun? They just climbed right over it up the post to get to the bird feeder, knocked it off. <laughs> so it didn't work for them. So I had a higher one, and a uh, bear came in. And um, it, they could care less about it, pulled the feeder down. They, they're sitting right there. So obviously they weren't scared. Deer, it may work, but I'm not sure because I'm using this. Plus, this one I got, um, friend uh, Lee Reich, who's actually an author down in Hudson Valley. He's written a lot of great books, uh, Dr. Reich developed this, you can buy it, it's called Deer Chaser. And what it is, is a light, and this is the motion sensor, it's on 24 hours, and a radio. Oh. And you can put whatever station, I just have a public radio talk station 24-7 <laughs> on. So you get within the range there, this comes on, it, it startles us. We're out work, walking in the garden, all of a sudden, who are those people talking, you know? And the light comes on, but hopefully that's doing some work. He, he swears by it, says it's really getting there out of his garden. So I've got one of these. Um, they are pretty much waterproof, but I've got a plastic case. I mounted it on a post. Mm -hmm. So one, that keeps the rain off, but two, I can move it about. So again, you 
you don't want the deer to get too used to where it is. So every few days, I'll just move it to a different part of the garden. So it's just but an arsenal chaser. at your house. Oh, I tell you that. I, I wonder. <laughs> Do sometime. they work uh, on pugs? Yeah, oh, they maybe. Might, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Although they're used to people, so yeah. I'm not so sure. <laughs> now, Anne, you have a few more issues to highlight for us. Well, again, sort of more of the cool, wet spring issues. The, uh, I brought a picture of a slime mold, and that's uh, something that shows up after a lot of wet weather. It oh, shows right. up on bark mulch. It yeah, looks, why on the mulch? I don't know why. The uh, spores or something? Yeah, they are spores. It's a primitive fungus, and it sort of looks like it can move along the mm. um, the mulch. It doesn't hurt anything. Uh, just wait till it dries up. You can hit it with a rake, and mm -hmm. it'll just disperse. But it may come back next rain. Should you dig it up and throw it away, or? Well, uh, you know, there's still spores everywhere, so yeah. you probably aren't going to be able to get rid of everything. Okay. Uh, the other thing we might be seeing, uh, getting some calls about, uh, is a disease, a fungal disease called anthracnose, mm -hmm. and that's another common disease in cool, wet springs that attacks maple, ash, oak, mm -hmm. sycamore, and it causes this browning along the leaf veins. By the time you see it, there's not much you can do about it, and it really won't kill the tree, it might set it back a little bit, but uh, often if it's early enough, they'll um, re, you know, re-leaf out, so, but just something to be uh, uh, watching out for. Okay, and what else have you got? Well, the other thing was, uh, uh, Leonard mentioned it, the aphids, it's, uh, aphids like really succulent tissue, and so I think this spring we've had a lot of new growth, it's sort of stayed around because it's been a prolonged spring, so right. we are seeing a lot of aphids. Uh, in all different crops, and like Leonard was saying, um, you just, you know, when you're looking at problems on your plants, always look on the underside of the leaf, because I, <laughs> uh, I get samples in the clinic, and people don't know what's going on, and I say, oh, well, there's aphids, but you just have to look on the underside. So always check that underside. Um, there's lots of generations per year. Usually you don't have to spray anything because they're good natural predators. Mm -hmm. But if you feel like you need to spray something, there's good organic products like Leonard mentioned, safer insecticidal soap, neem, things like that. Or often a, just a jet of water. Oh, if okay. they're not curled in, up mm -hmm. in leaves, just, just a jet of water. Spray them down. Right, right. Okay. Another uh, disease that we've been seeing and hearing about is uh, uh, not a disease, but an insect issue in boxwood is uh, boxwood leaf miner. So if you have boxwood and you're seeing these patches of brown sort of split open uh, the leaf between the upper and the lower leaf and these little larvae feed in between those layers. So they're really protected once they're in there, mm -hmm. but they can cause your boxwoods to look, look pretty bad. So you can try to squish them. Uh, prune them off so they don't um, complete their life cycle. Also, there are systemic insecticides mm -hmm. if you have a lot of boxwood and it's you know really important. Okay, great. So from a seasonal point of view, is there anything coming up later this month that uh, people should be aware of? Well, I think you know with all this wet weather, that is perfect for all sorts of fungal diseases. So I think people in the next couple of weeks are going to start seeing apple scab. I brought a picture of apple mm -hmm. scab on their apples. That's the one with the brown, uh, uh, leaf spot, and then we're also going to see cedar apple rust, that bright yellow spot. And once you see this on the trees, you know, you should have been spraying early, so right. it's too late, but uh, just be aware. And again, it won't kill your tree. You might want to fertilize it so it um, can boost. withstand, yeah, mm -hmm. prune it. Uh, so that there's good air circulation, leaves dry off quickly. And I'll let her know you have more information on your website as well. I do, Judy. On, I've got articles on a lot of these different topics, as well as, um, got to mention, a tour we have coming up right. to Philadelphia in mm -hmm. July. Um, and, and the deadline is June 20th, so come in right up uh, to register if you're interested in that. We'll be going to Longwood Gardens, uh, famous Morris Arboretum of uh, University of Pennsylvania, one of the top design gardens in the country, Chanticleer Garden. Gardens, two of the top flower trials in the country, uh, the famous Burpee Ford Hook Farms in Doylestown, and then out in the Amish country, uh, Penn State University trials, where they trial over a thousand different different annuals <laughs> and uh, hundreds of different perennials. So we've got a lot to see, a few more sites on there. Um, Charlie Nardozzi will be accompanying me on that again, co-hosting that. So it should be a really fun trip. So people are interested, they can go to my website, perrysperennials.info or 
www.homegardenerscience.com and there's a link on the top but also the home gardener section has a tour section and you can find the full information there and uh, registration form. And, and if gardeners have any questions they can turn to the Master Gardener helpline. Yeah that's a great resource. Uh, you can Google UVM Master Gardener. Oh well there's the website mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, toll-free number if you're outside of Chittenden County. Um, so please call and if you're seeing something it's likely that we've already seen it in the clinic or at the helpline so mm -hmm. we've got people to help them okay terrific thanks yeah. well thanks for joining us today yeah thank thanks. you that's our program for today i'm judy simpson we'll see you again next time on across the fence mm -hmm.